Greetings, everybody. This is going to be part 20 of Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen, A-L-L-E-N. This is going to be chapter two of whatever part this book is, part three. Um, and this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description. The you know who's know exactly who lost Israel is. They know exactly who we are. They know. Which is why they're working so hard to... Um, well, let's just say... The land, our lands are being flooded with uh, non-Israelite people, the heathen. I'm going to paraphrase this, but it was a quote that I heard. I don't know who it was or exactly how it goes, but it's along these lines. It said to destroy a people, you have to sever or cut off them from their roots. Um, take a look at all the Confederate statues and plaques and what have you that have been coming down from all over the country. And yet, you can have a statue of Baphomet, um, you know, a goat headed, a man with a goat head with little children looking up at him lovingly, um, which is representative of the devil, that's okay, but a statue of Robert E. Lee is um, terrible, right? So a statue of the devil's okay, but a statue of a, a white Christian is bad, right? Yeah. So you get the idea. So... You got to cut them off from their roots. Well, what happened to northern Israel when they went into the Assyrian Empire? Well, they took them from their land and relocated them to a different area. And from what I understand with history, they were forbidden to speak their old language. And if you have a people that come over from another country to the United States and they no longer are able to speak, well, are forbidden to speak their old language. How many generations until their old language is forgotten by their children and grandchildren? You know, so wouldn't Israel forget who they were if they could no longer tell the stories and no longer read the writings and speak the language, the Hebrew, yeah, it'd be gone. So, this link in the description, the you know who's know who lost Israel is, but what they do is they want to claim that the you know who's are our brothers, uh, genetically, racially, whatever, however you want to put it. But you got to realize the site that with the link in the description is antichrist it is antichrist i look one thing i do when i'm looking at a ministry or a site i look at the about page if it's a a religious site i look at their statement of faith but this site has absolutely no uh no mention of jesus christ who, Jesus, who is Christ, and uh, they're talking about keeping laws and this and that for, you know, yeah. You can go to their About page and, and read, and you'll know uh, they have nothing to do with the God of the Bible. They're just there to deceive. And yet they know where Israel migrated to, they know, uh, they even mention that uh, King James uh, 
lineage goes back to King David. And they mention the coronation of the ancient Israelite kings of you know Judah and compare it with uh, the coronation of the British kings. So, and it has more information, you know, you could read it, but just realize that the site is Antichrist. And uh, which is one of the problems that I found out with the, uh, what was his name, Herbert Armstrong, the Worldwide Church of God. Um, they're along the same way. They call them, they call that British Israelism. And you know, it's like rat poison, you know, uh, rat poison, you know, the bait is like 99% good food with 1% poison in it. Rat eats it, thinks, hey, I'm getting a good meal here. I'm hungry. I'm getting fed. But the 1% poison kills them. And that's what these sites are. They have some truthful information and a lot of poison. It's more than 1%, trust me. But they even mention that Tia Tephi, T-E-A-T-E-P-H-I, the legend or history of Jeremiah taking her to uh, Ireland. And this book that I'm reading Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright is starting to get into this information. So it's actually, uh, uh, you know, all our history and roots has been severed, cut off, destroyed, lost, forgotten. But it will become apparent in the days when uh, the genocide becomes apparent. I mean, it's, it's not happening yet, but it will. It will. And then some people are going to wake up. But a lot of people are going to uh, except the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, whatever name the Bible uses. Well, those four names are used in the Bible. Some people will renounce Christ and follow the beast, 666, the whole, the whole thing, to save their miserable earthly existence on this earth. Like Esau sold his birthright a, a God-given blessing, sold it for a bowl of beans. He despised his birthright. Can you imagine that? God gives you a, a gift and he despised it. He hated it. Yeah, a bowl of beans is more important than a gift of God. And that's how a lot of these churchgoers are going to sell their birthright well i don't know birthright their uh covenant with the lord for their survival in this miserable wicked world so all right um uh, chapter two the name and title of this chapter is jacob's pillow pillar stone i guess i should read that story well eh, it's not really necessary um, Jacob was traveling yeah I'll read it all right let's go to Genesis chapter 28 all I know is these churchgoers that don't do not bother to read the Bible the entire Bible um, are fools really they're fools can you find salvation without reading the Bible yes absolutely but if you're going to listen to a preacher that is a hireling 
for a 501c3 tax-exempt corporation that calls itself a church, you're going to possibly run into trouble. So, what can I tell you? So let's go to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis. We're going to read about chapter 28. We're going to read about Abraham's grandson called Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel, which means rules with God or prince of God or prince with God. So, Genesis 28, and this is going to tie into this chapter that I'm get, getting ready to read. Um, Mr. Allen could have, you know, he could have read, you know, put the whole chapter in there. The book's already fairly good size. It'd be a lot larger if, you know, if he included all these chapters, but, you know, hey, I got time. All right, Genesis 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him, gave him a commandment and said unto him, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. You know, the Canaanites. And uh, your modern church world says, well, you know, the Canaanites, they were just unbelievers. But now Jesus comes and, and wants to save them all. Yeah. And don't think it wasn't lost on Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, that his brother Esau had married uh, two Hittite women of the Canaanite tribe. Yeah. So, verse 2. So he tells him, Arise, go to Padananaram, Padananaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude, a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. Now remember, God told Abraham he'd be the father of many nations, not just one little antichrist place in the Middle East created by the United Antichrist and United Nations in 1948. Uh-uh. Verse 5. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram, to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, well, too late, Esau, you already married two Hittite women, then went Esau unto Ishmael. Now, who was Ishmael? Ishmael was the son of Abraham via Hagar, the Egyptian woman. Yeah, she was the child of the flesh, not the child of the promise. Um, a lot of the Arabs claim descent of Abraham from Ishmael. But according to the Bible, Ishmael was rejected as the promised seed. God said he would bless Ishmael, but he was not to be the chosen seed line. And I did an entire Bible study on that very subject, which uh, 
YouTube and Google doesn't like. So what can I tell you? And my opinion is, I bet you if you went back far enough with the royal family of the of the um, Saudis, I bet you they're Esau Ishmael. I bet you. Well, you know, I'm not really a betting man, but that would be my best educated guess. You know, so that's why they're friends with the you know who's and the USSA. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, uh, Mahalaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Stones. Hmm. What's up with stones? Boy, I could do an entire Bible study on stones. I mean, after all, what did David kill Goliath with? Oh, yeah. Um, in Matthew 3, 9, I, I'd have to look it up, but uh, I think it was John the Baptist saying uh, to the Pharisees, And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Oh, yeah. In 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All right, let's uh, take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And, you know, those that hate Jesus will deny Paul. You know, Corinth was a city in Greece that Paul was preaching to. See, if you get rid of Paul, you get rid of the connection that the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew, and you lose the connection, you know, sever the roots to get rid of a people's heritage, to be able to destroy them. Um, you find out that um, the Greeks were, at least some of them, were dispersed Israel. Jeremiah 3, eight, God divorced Israel, not, not Judah. And then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, he says he'd make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul tells the people of Corinth, that they were with Moses when they came out of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. And I did a Bible study on this, by the way. Um, I have well over 1,000 Bible studies. Send me a USB drive. I'll send you all of them. You know, make sure it's a fast drive, though, and at least 64 gigabyte, please. You know, it's a, it's a, a lot of files. A lot. Huge. So, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. God sent Paul to tell these people not to be ignorant. Ignorance is a, a lack of knowledge in a subject. I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. 
and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What did Moses do? He took Israel out of Egypt. And there was a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud, a pillar cloud by the day, and they passed through the Red Sea. They were, that was basically their baptism when they went through the Red Sea. Verse 3, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, the manna falling down from heaven. And if you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, may I suggest after you read Genesis, you read the book of Exodus. Because all this is history of our people. And we're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. What's this, what's this drinking of a rock? What, what's up with that? Well, they were out in the desert. There was no water. God told Moses to strike the rock and water came out. And if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, you're not talking about little drips. I mean, you're probably talking about like a dozen fire hoses of water. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, they were, the people had to drink and their, their animals, their livestock, the cattle and what have you. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ is the rock, the cornerstone that the church is built on. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they are also lusted neither be ye idolaters as some of them were as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play people in the time of the beast of revelation the antichrist they're going to make an image of the beast and people are either going to worship it or die just like in daniel's time uh, with Nebuchadnezzar. He made the the statue of gold. Yeah. And the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they wouldn't do it, so they were thrown into the furnace of fire. And uh, Christ saved them, right? Oh, yeah. You know, the Bible is our history. People died to give us the Bible in our language. People died to do this because the Pope at Rome decided that the book was too holy for people to read in the common vulgar language. Actually, probably they were more afraid that people would uh, read the Bible and realize that the Pope was a fraud. He was a fraud then and he's a fraud now. Um, but actually, there's been a few good popes, a few decent ones, I should say. Not There's none good, no, not one, except for Christ. But um, Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. God got mad at these people and killed twenty-three thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents, flying, fiery serpents. Ooh. Neither murmur. God hates murmuring. You know, God gives you a meal, and you're going to complain, well, I didn't want this manna. I wanted a pepperoni pizza, or I wanted a steak with mushrooms and mashed potatoes and onions you know i'm sick of this manna 
Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. I'm manna, manna, manna every day. I'm sick of it. 23,000 dead people. God gives you something, be thankful. God only promises us two things in this life, food and clothing. That's it, food and raiment. Paul says, if you have those things, be content. He doesn't promise us a, a Honda, doesn't promise us a house to live in. Nope. Jesus even said that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Yeah. And if the creator of heaven and earth didn't have a home, what makes you think we're better than he? Yeah. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath been, uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow, will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. I could keep reading this, but um, yeah, this is really, what a, what a, and people will tell you this guy is a false apostle. Really? The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Uh, we're talking about the Passover meal. You know. Um, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to all idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatever is sold in the shambles, you know, the market, that eat asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. In other words, don't ask if this uh, steak has been offered unto idols. You know, say your blessing over the food, you know. Uh, Lord God, please bless this steak. And this food that I am partaking of, I ask this in Jesus' name. There you go. Even though it was sacrificed unto idols, Christ's blood can cleanse it, right? Absolutely. 28. If any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscious, I say, not mine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? 
Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And Antichrist devils will tell you that Paul is a false apostle. Does that sound like a false apostle? Uh, no, not to me. So, all right, let's go back to Genesis 28. I guess we'll start in verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba. I wonder if that's uh, where they made Budweiser. No, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I know. Don't quit my job, right? As a comedian. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And that stone that he made as a pillow uh, is going to figure prominently in later on. Verse 12. And he dreamed, Jacob, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, his children. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Has the you-know-who's blessed all the families of the earth? Uh, <laughs> yeah. What has the Western Christian world given the world? Well, farming and water plants, clean water, sewage disposal, um, electricity, lighting, motors, airplanes, cars. Yeah. Have we been a blessing to the earth? Hmm, I wonder. And in thy and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And yet they want to get rid of us. Oh yeah. The children of wickedness, the Bible calls them. And behold, I, the Lord, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Wow. See, the Lord speaks things in the past tense, even though they're in the future. Jacob doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have any children. But the Lord says, oh, your, your seed's going to spread to the north, the southeast, and the west. And it, your seed's going to be like the dust of the earth. They're going to be all over the place. Millions upon millions, like the sand of the seashore, the Lord promised Abraham his children would be like. And I don't know about you, but I've been to the beach in Florida, and that's a lot of sand. Yeah, probably billions. And they want you to think a few million you-know-whos over here and there uh, fulfill all the prophecies that God made to Abraham. Yeah, right. Verse 16. 
And Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. He called, uh, he, uh, he anointed this stone with oil. And the anointing of oil with the uh, prophets to the kings of Israel and Judah was kind of a representation or a shadow to come of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Oil was represented as the Holy Spirit. I could do an entire Bible study on that, but um, yeah. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Do you know what the word Beth means? It means house in Hebrew. El, E-L, is a contraction, uh, has reference to the Lord God Almighty. So Bethel means house of God, or God's house. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, Ah, the only two things promised in this life, food and raiment, clothing, food and clothes. That's it. That's the only two things we're promised in this life, people. Jacob recognized that. Jacob's name was changed to uh, Israel, prince of God, rules with God. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, and this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. The tenth. What is the tenth? Ten percent of everything Jacob has, he's going to offer unto the Lord. That's what they, in the book of Leviticus, that's called the tithe. Oh yeah. The tithe was for the tribe of Levi, who were not given a portion of the land when Israel went into the land of Canaan and conquered it and took it. The Levites were to be those workers in the tabernacle, later the temple of the Lord. That was their job. The priests, the tribe of Jacob, I mean the tribe of Judah, was the civil rulers, the kings. So you had the kings and you had the priests. Christ was a merging of those. Joseph was of Judah. Mary was of Levi. You know, the Bible just, it makes so much sense to me anyways. I don't know. What do I know? I'm just some guy that reads the Bible once in a while. Uh, one thing I should point out, if we are the Hebrews of the Bible, and I'm certain we are, we have an obligation to the Lord to do the things that he says. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, Jesus had a lot of things. Um, let's see. In uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So, you know, there's a, a lot of responsibility there. So, 
All right, so let me start reading this book. Wow, I've spent over, uh, I've spent 40 minutes and I haven't even cracked open the book. So I hope that I've laid a good foundation for this. All right, chapter two, Jacob's Pillow Pillar Stone. I hope I laid a good foundation. When the Abrahamic covenant promises were given to Jacob, he was making a journey from Beersheba to Padanaram, but he had recently received from his father Isaac the blessing which carried with it those much desired covenants and the special blessings and promises which pertained to them. When Isaac gave this blessing to Jacob, he told him not to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, the land in which they were then living, but to go to Laban, his mother's brother, and to take a wife from among his daughters. Bob's note here. People don't, the, the great majority of churchgoers today do not believe in the children of wickedness. They don't believe that. I've got an entire playlist on the angels that send. Job 38, Genesis 6. You know, there was a... Uh, uh, I was flipping through the television channels the other night, and I think it was like one of those ancient alien shows or whatever. And it was talking about groups of families that had six fingers, six toes, six fingers, you know. And they were saying, is this an evolutionary trait that we used to have millions of years ago? And, you know, we lost it. And, you know, they were talking like it was a good thing. Well, Goliath and his family had six fingers and six toes. And today's modern church world wants you to think that believing men married unbelieving women and had giants for children with six fingers and six toes. And then God just says, go, go in and kill them all. Uh, does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me, but, you know, that's the nonsense they're teaching nowadays. So, yeah. Yeah, believing men married unbelieving women and had giants with six fingers for children. Yeah. Right. So, you know, <laughs> Isaac and Jacob were told, don't marry Canaanites. Don't do it. But not all the Canaanites were giants. Not all of them. So, let's keep reading the book. It is hardly to be supposed that Jacob was traveling entirely alone, for that was not an oriental custom. We learn from incidental remarks that are dropped elsewhere in reference to his journey that he had with him a tent which was pitched at night and that the journey was made on foot for he walked with a staff. The sacred record deals chiefly with that which took place between Jacob and the Lord with but the slightest incidental mention of details as concerning a certain sundown and stones for pillows. The first mention of stones for pillows with reference to this occasion is plural. But suddenly one of these pillow stones is brought into great distinction. The facts which brought that special stone into such uh, prominence may be quickly read for the Bible account of them is very short. Yeah, and that's that's why I read Genesis 28. Um, so that you could, you know, catch the whole story. But we doubt whether many who have read the record of those facts realize their true symbolic import. We doubt also whether we shall be able to explain, even approximately, not only the great distinction which has been bestowed upon the stone as a symbol, but also the exalted place it has occupied ever since it came into historic notice or the supreme greatness of that position of which prophecy declares it shall yet be raised. 
If we read the prophets aright, no such glorious prominence, high honored use, or divinely declared purpose has ever been given to any other inanimate thing on the earth as that which is yet in reserve for that special pillow stone upon which Jacob rested his head on that certain night when he camped before Luz on his way to Badan Aram. It seems to have been the custom among Oriental travelers when they pitched their tents for the night to take stones for headpieces or holsters, bolsters, in order to raise that part of their bedding on which their heads rested to a comfortable position for rest and sleep. At least this is what Jacob did, and as he slept, he dreamed. Bob's note here. I doubt, sincerely doubt, he actually, his head rested against the stone. He might have used it for uh, a propping support, um, but I'm sure he had, you know, like a pillow or something between his head and the stone. Uh, I don't think a stone would be very comfortable, but hey, what do I know? Uh, at least this is what Jacob did, and as he slept, he dreamed. In his dream, he saw what he called a ladder, but which may be called a staircase, or an open way that reached from earth to heaven, for the top of it, it reached to heaven. Bob's note here. Isn't it funny how the uh, DNA, genetics, looks like a twisted ladder? A spiral ladder. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. The angels of God were ascending and descending by this existing way, which for the time was made visible to the inheritor of the covenant promises, and at the top, above all, that throne, that throng of radiant comers and goers, the Lord stood and gave Jacob the full text of the covenants as formerly given to Abraham and Isaac. Remember, Jacob was Abraham's grandson. And if you're interested, I have an entire playlist on the covenants. And Abraham deals very prominently in that playlist. You know? Playlists. Look them up. There's a lot of information on the playlists. Um, I was going through my playlists and noticed a lot of missing videos. Because you know who has been deleting my videos. Oh, yeah. That's awful nice of them. They don't want you to know this information. You know, when they can't prove you wrong... They uh, delete your work or call you names or both. You terrible person, you. All right, let's keep reading. Upon hearing and receiving these promises from the Lord, Jacob awoke, startled, convicted, and afraid, Startled because, as he thought, he had accidentally got into God's house and stumbled through the gate which led away from this world to that pure one of which he had just caught a glimpse. Afraid, just as any man would be who had defrauded his brother and taken advantage of the love and confidence of a blind and aged father, convicted. Bob's note here. Um... Jacob was being obedient to his mother when he deceived his father. And Esau was bad news. Jacob, I have, I, Jacob to me was absolutely justified in everything that he did. And it was God's plan. That's why it succeeded, my opinion, anyways. It could not have been otherwise, for he had caught a glimpse of the holiness of God and the purity of a sinless world. Hence, 
in the agony of that fear which must ever be experienced by the wicked when brought into contact with absolute holiness he cried out how dreadful is this place and of course he wasn't talking about heaven he was talking about the sinful world right this is none other but the house of god and this is the gate of heaven that which would have been a great joy to a holy man was only a means of torture to this sinful one who is fleeing from the anger of an outraged brother but he soon began to yield himself to god and as he yielded there came to him that ever accompanying desire i.e the desire to worship with these things there came also spiritual intuition of coming events and of their importance to him in his relations to the divine covenants then jacob awed by the sublime majesty of the holy one deeply impressed by the greatness of the promises made to him stirred in the depths of his inner nature by the heavenly vision pressed by the weight of responsibility yet encouraged by the dawning gladness in his heart and moved by the spirit of prophecy took the stone he took the stone upon which his head had rested and set it up for a pit pillar of witness bob's note here there's been a few times in the bible where people set up a stone as a witness uh, you can read about it in um well let's let's read it real quick here's an interesting verse i never even i don't remember this um first samuel 7 12 then samuel took a stone a stone and set it between mizpah and shen and he called the name of it ebenezer so he actually gave the stone a name and called the name of it ebenezer saying Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Oh, yeah. Huh. I had to, I knew the, uh, well, let's, in Joshua chapter 22, um, verse 34, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, E-D, Ed. You know, short for, they made it Edward, right? Um, it is a, uh, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. So they took an altar of stone and actually gave it a name called Ed. And I'm real disappointed in the King James Bible Online.org because I actually looked for Ed. And it didn't show up in the listings but not only that but um, they have a place where they do comments for people where people can make uh, discussion it's it's at the top of the page discussion where people could ask questions and post things and what have you and chaplain Bob's been banned twice for quoting Jesus yeah makes you wonder doesn't it are all these people antichrists i don't know i didn't know quoting jesus could get you banned i'm being sarcastic people um all right so some of these stone altars were given names so uh let's go back to Let's see. All right. Uh, all right. So he was moved by the, Jacob was moved by the spirit of prophecy, took the stone upon which his head had rested and set it up for a pillar of witness. And that's what, that's what Ed means, witness. At the same time, he anointed it with oil, called it Bethel, used it for an altar at which to worship and upon which to make a vow unto the Lord of his unto the Lord God 
of his father, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. And that's, we just read that in Genesis 28. It is the most significant fact that the name Bethel, or God's house, should have been given to the stone by the one who was the father of the twelve patriarchs, you know, the twelve tribes, who were the progenitors of that great multitude, which is also called the house of God, the hosts of God, and the families of God. And in the 38th Psalm, the house of Israel, the hidden ones, which while hidden are to develop into many nations, are called the houses of God. Should we read that? Hmm. Yeah, maybe we should read that. What do you say? What do you say? I'm sorry. Did I say the 38th Psalm? No, it's the 83rd Psalm. So let's read the 83rd Psalm that is mentioned in this book. Boy, this is a long chapter too. Holy moly. This is going to be a long long study wow this might be two hours long a lot of good information though my opinion 83rd psalm a song or a song or psalm of asaph a-s-a-p-h um asaph and king david um made a lot of the psalms uh scholars say that these were actual songs that they sang in the temple or tabernacle temple hadn't been built yet keep not thou silence o god hold not thy peace and be not still o god for lo thine enemies did you know the Lord has enemies? Listen to the modern church world. No, God loves everybody. <clears throat> God doesn't have enemies. Some places say Satan doesn't even exist. You ever heard that? Satan doesn't even exist. It's just our sin nature. Yeah. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Who do they hate? They hate the Lord. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines, uh, Bob's note here, the uh, Goliath, you know, the giant with six fingers, six toes, those giants were Philistines. The Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyr also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, 
as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the book of Kisson, which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all the princes as Zeba and as Zalmunna, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the Most High over all the earth. Hmm. The Hidden Ones. All right, let's keep reading. Uh, also in the 83rd Psalm, the House of Israel, the Hidden Ones, which while hidden are to develop into many nations, are called the Houses of God. We must bear in mind the fact that Jacob gave the name of Bethel not only to the place or locality where the stone was set up, but also to the stone pillar, for he emphatically declared, This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. We understand, however, that God inspired both the choice of this stone and its name, for when he spoke to Jacob, he said, I am the God of Bethel. This means, I am the God of God's house. Or, in other words, the God of the Bethel stone, which is in the place called Bethel. Thus the Lord associates himself not only with the place where he appeared to Jacob, but also with the Bethel rock. Please bear with me, people. This is a long chapter. I didn't know that. Uh, 20 years later, Jacob returned to the land of Canaan with great riches and with the knowledge that his prosperity was was a result of divine favor and intervention. For the Lord had showed him how one who's called the angel of God was given power to control the breeding of the cattle. That's another story in um, Bob's note. That was another story when Jacob uh, went to work for Laban and he wanted uh, his daughters for a wife. He was the... Um, uh, working and part of the cattle would be Laban's and part would be Jacob's uh, depending upon how they were colored and the Lord uh, had all the cattle the colors that would have been Jacob's you know like if you had a dog litter of puppies getting ready to be born and you know, it's like all the black dogs will be yours and all the other color dogs will be mine. And then all the black dogs are born. They're all black. Um, you know, you split them up. But the Lord intervened and all the cattle were Jacob's. And Laban felt cheated. But actually Laban had cheated Jacob. That's But that's another story. In Genesis... Yeah, but people don't read that stuff because they're idiots. Okay, before Jacob reached Canaan, he had confessed his wrongdoing and made peace with his brother and God had taken away from him not only the name of supplanter, you know, Jacob means uh, trickster, supplanter, but also the inborn supplanter nature and given him the victorious name of Israel, Prince of God. It is a well-known fact that the place called Bethel and the city of Luz were so near each other that the two names are used interchangeably in the scriptures, or rather that the name Bethel often included the little city which was previously called Luz. But before we can understand the true relation of both Bethel and the Bethel rock, 
to our general subject. We must know to whom or to which of the tribes Bethel was given as a possession. The sacred historian, when describing the boundaries of the lot in Canaan, which fell to Joseph, describes one of those border lines as follows. And it goeth out from Bethel to Luz and path along unto the borders of Archai to Ashtaroth. And that's in Joshua 16, verse 2. Also is the description of that portion which fell to the children of Benjamin. Their portion lay between Judah and Joseph, Judah being to the south and Joseph to the north of Benjamin. We have the following. And the border went over from thence, beth -Avon, toward Luz, to the side of Luz, which is Bethel southward. Joshua 18.13 from this, we perceive not only that Benjamin's, Benjamin's border was south of Bethel, but also that Bethel, the place where Jacob set up the Bethel pillar stone, was on the south side of the city proper. Further, it is recorded that the children of Dan could not conquer the Amorites, and that the Amorites drove them into the mountains and occupied those portions of Dan's inheritance, which best suited them. But it is also recorded that the house of Jacob, Jacob, I'm sorry, the house of Joseph did conquer those Amorites, that they compelled them to become their dependents and that they fixed their boundary lines. In the description of these boundaries, we have the following. And the coast of the Amorites, which was from the going up to Akrabim, from the rock and upward, Judges 1, 26. Some may think that this reference to the rock refers to the rock Etam or Etam rock. This is not possible because both Etam, the city, and the rock Etam are southwest of Jerusalem in the hill country of Judea and had nothing whatsoever to do with the borders of Joseph, Dan, or the Amorites. Hence, the phrase, from the rock and upward, can mean only Bethel, the place of the rock, or from the Bethel rock, and up from the mountains of Ephraim, Samaria, Israel. Again, concerning the house of Joseph, Bethel, and Luz, we have the following. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph went to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city was Luz, and the spy saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof of Luz. And that's in Judges chapter 1, verses 22 through 26. Thus, with the building of that other Luz, the name of Luz not only departed forever from Bethel, but it is never again mentioned in sacred history. Finally, when Jeroboam of the house of Joseph was made king of the ten tribes and became fearful that the people would, if allowed to go up to Jerusalem to worship, that they would kill him, and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. So he, to prevent this, made two golden calves, of which it is said, He set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. His right to place one in Bethel was undisputed because it was not only the king's sanctuary, but it was also in his own tribal territory. He had a sovereign's right to place one in Dan, for all who went there to worship were confederate with him. The Dan referred to was the city of Dan, which was situated in the northern part of his realm. Now, one point is settled beyond the possibility of doubt, and that is that Bethel was a part of the inheritance which fell to the house of Joseph when the land of Canaan was divided among the children of Jacob. 
This brings us to a vital point concerning the subject in hand, namely, that not only Bethel, the city or place, but also that Bethel, the pillar rock, was given to the birthright family, and that Israel carried that rock with them into Egypt. And in their subsequent journeyings in the wilderness. Proof. Jacob died in Egypt, and his posterity, his children, were in Egypt at the time. When dying, Jacob called unto him his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which may befall you in the last days. Bob's note here. Here you go, people. You got in Genesis prophecy for the last days, the end times. Yeah. But uh, churches won't read this stuff. When his sons, in response to this call, came together, he gave a prophecy concerning that which the posterity of each of them would be in the last days. But while he was making the prophecy concerning Joseph and his house, to whom he had given just given the birthright, he stopped in the midst of his prophetic utterances and used the following parathetical expression, From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Thence, as herein used, is an adverb used as a noun and is equivalent in value to that place or the place to which it refers. The phrase from thence means out of there, out from thither, or out of that place. Since the place from whence the stone came was the inheritance of Joseph, and since Bethel, the place of the stone, was the inheritance of Joseph, we must know that it came from thence, i.e. Bethel. Thus the very fact that Jacob was dying in Egypt made use of those words in reference to that Bethel stone carries proof on its very face that the stone was not at that time in the place where it had formerly been, but that it was with them there in Egypt and had previously been committed to the care of the house of Joseph. Uh, people, this chapter is, wow, it's, it's long. I think I'm going to break this up into a part A and a part B because I've always already gone an hour. So we will continue. Uh, this is going to be part A. The we're going to continue in uh, page 238 with part B. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>